Hey guys, this is Jeff Stanick with Figured Out Baseball. Got a really good Figured Out Baseball podcast today that I've been looking forward to for weeks. Uh, I'm really excited to get into this one. It's different than a lot of our podcasts where we, we normally are talking to a lot of on-field coaches and players. This one we're talking to a former player and a former coach, I believe, uh, but someone who's got a little bit of a different story in the baseball world. We're being joined today by Rob Nelson. I don't know if that name will be as familiar to you as his product. Rob is the creator of Big League Chew, which I'm sure if you're listening to a baseball podcast, you have not only heard of, but uh, have probably experienced Big League Chew on your own. I want to give you a quick background on Rob. I'll kind of tell you uh, just very, very briefly how he got to where he is today and just some uh, some very basic background before we jump into questions with him. So Rob was born in Brooklyn, New York, grew up uh, on Long Island. He went to Nassau Community College and then Cornell, where he was a left-handed pitcher. Uh, Cornell, of course, in the Ivy League. After graduating from college, he played professionally first in Cape Town, South Africa, where he was there for two years. While he was playing, he was also teaching middle school, which might be an interesting thing to get into with him. Uh, he then, from Cape Town, found himself in Portland, Oregon, trying out for a team called the Portland Mavericks, which is kind of where Big League Chu was born. He didn't make the team, but he stuck around and had v various rules with the team in his third season with the Mavericks in 1977 while sitting in the bullpen with a guy named Jim Bouton who for for older people or people that are just that have a uh, an ear for older you know former players that was a Yankee all-star who at the time was was just very coincidentally pitching for the Mavericks uh, but those two had a conversation in a bullpen, and then Big League Chew was born. We'll definitely hear more about that from from Rob himself in a few minutes. But the Portland Mavericks themselves are an independent league team in Portland, Oregon, who you may have heard of because they were featured in a Netflix documentary called The Battered Bastards of Baseball, in which Rob actually made an appearance as himself. Uh, another cool thing we probably should get into at some point, he's not only the inventor of gum, but he's got a chance to uh, you know, play himself in, a, in something on Netflix, which had to have been pretty cool. In 1978, while he was trying to get Big League Chew off the ground, he saw an ad for a do-it-yourself gum-making kit. He ordered a kit, made his first batch. Uh, the rest is history, and, and we'll get into a little bit about the story of of where he made that, which is also just a, a unique part of the story that we'll hear here. Uh, Big League Chew was first introduced by Wrigley's. Or Wrigley's originally made Big League Chew was introduced in 1980, I believe. He's has since sold more than 800 million pouches of Big League Chew, just a, a, an unfathomable number. Uh, and in addition to Rob being the gum guy and being the Big League Chew guy, he also pitched professionally, not only in Cape Town, South Africa for three different stints, but he also pitched professionally in Australia and England, as well as uh, and he got some appearances for the Portland Mavericks in the Independent League uh, in Portland, Oregon. But just a, a super interesting guy, a guy with a, a really an unbelievable background. When you hear his story, you're going to you're going to keep picturing Forrest Gump, where like everybody he meets is somebody and and or turns into somebody that you've heard of or you've experienced in the past. Uh, just a, a really unique story that I'm excited to get into. So, Rob, I certainly appreciate you joining us on this podcast. It's going to be a great one. Uh, quite the introduction. Uh, pleasure to be here, Jeff. This is going to be fun. So I typically, Rob, would we'll start with with things from the bio that stand out, and obviously you have a lot of things that stand out. Uh, but I'd like to just kind of to give people the proper background if they have not heard your story before. Um, I'd like to start with you sitting in the bullpen with Jim Bouton uh, and, and how that conversation. I know you've probably told this story a million times, but for people that have never heard it, I, I'd like to just kind of start there, and maybe you can kind of tell people how how Big League Chew sort of got its legs at the very beginning. Uh, absolutely. You know, the story never gets old for me because it, it, it seems like I'm talking about somebody else. I mean, it was a very long time ago, uh, but I was a marginal player. Uh, I only won one game for the Portland Mavericks in three seasons there. Uh, as luck would have it, the owner, uh, Bing Russell, better known as the sheriff on the Bonanza TV series, transplanted New England guy from Maine, went west to Hollywood to try to become a big star. In many ways, Bing's attempts to be a major motion picture guy and me to become the next Whitey Ford are very similar. We had to make alternative routes when it looked like our initial plan wasn't going to work. But Bing gave me the opportunity to stick around when I didn't do particularly well uh, during the tryouts. Uh, truth is, I got hit like a pinata. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and Bing, he just liked me. I, I, I liked him, and uh, he knew a bit of my background. I'm, you know, son of a New York City cop, and 
just kind of a baseball junkie. And he, and very early on in our friendship, he said, yeah, you know, you got a big league head. Uh, unfortunately, you don't have a big league arm. <laughs> and uh, he said, but there are ways you can help this team. And I ended up running the tryouts. I became the pitching coach. I did a lot of odds and ends for, for Big Russell and his team. Sold tickets on the phone. It was it was just a labor of love. It was such a great vibe uh, in Portland in the middle seventies. Uh, the film really nailed it. They really talked about uh, the city and the fans and the players who came there uh, as they were. Anyway, I'm in the bullpen with Jim. It's my third season. I still haven't won a game. Uh, when you don't play a lot, you observe a lot and you have a lot of conversations. And Jim and I were looking at teammates who were chewing red man and making a mess of the bullpen and, and laughing and spitting. And, and Jim had asked me if I had ever chewed uh, tobacco. And I said, I tried it once. I remember the field. I remember the player who, who, who gave it to me. His name was Danny Smith. We were in Johannesburg, South Africa. And I said, I probably chewed it for 30 seconds. I got so ill, I couldn't throw batting practice, which was the plan. I was, I was the player coach on a team touring Rhodesia and South Africa at that time. That was 1976. So I said, yeah, I, I, I can't say that I tried it for less than a minute. And, and Jim said, yeah, me too. It never made sense to him, uh, nor to me. Uh, and then maybe an inning later, I said, I've had an idea for some time. And it, it was due to a prior conversation I'd had with one of the Maverick Bat Boys, Todd Field, which is another story in and of itself. But but basically, I said, what would you think if we shredded gum and put it in a pouch so we could look like cool guys, but we wouldn't make ourselves ill? And Jim had pitched for the Yankees. He'd written ball four. He was a TV personality in and around New York City. He was a very savvy businessman, aside from being a, a great competitor. I had shared the idea with other people, but Jim Bouton is the only guy who said the three things that mattered. He said, number one, that's really a fun idea. Uh, uh, number two, he said, I could sell that idea. Nobody had ever said that to me before. You know, I was a philosophy major at Cornell and, and I ended up going to grad school, was a middle school teacher, as you mentioned. So I really didn't have the business uh, touch that Jim Bouton had. And then the third thing he asked me, which of course is critical to the whole story, he said, what would you call it? And I plucked the name out of the air. And, uh, my brother Ed always says, it's like four guys in a pub in Liverpool saying, all right, lads, what are we going to call the band? You know, and Ringo says, how about Beatles? That's a cool name. It's like the magic of Big League Chew was just like the magic of the Beatles for a rock and roll band. <laughs> that name was perfect for them. Big League Chew was perfect for me. And, and who knows where it came from. But those three things, he liked the idea, he thought it was fun, he said he could sell the idea, but it needed a name, and within a matter of minutes, we had what my dad used to call lightning in a pouch. Just two guys, you know, on a handshake. Jim put up about 10 grand to do some of the legal work that was required, possible patents and trademarks and so forth. As luck would have it, one of the boys in my baseball day camp, which Bing allowed me to start, called the Little Maverick Baseball School. Uh, I used my Maverick teammates as, as coaches during the morning, and they would be playing baseball at night. But the one of the kids in that camp, Scotty Chernoff, was the son of the late, great Dan Chernoff, who was a trademark and patent guy here in Portland, uh, a fellow Cornell guy, 10 years older than I. But everybody seemed to want to help me out when I came to Portland, Oregon. That's why I still live here. And I grew up in, on Long Island and went to college eventually in upstate New York. But, but Oregon's been home since the 70s. But back then with the story, it was like two guys. It, it's like you see in the movies. I've got a band and you've got a barn. Let's put on a show. And, and it took Jim about two years to get it right, pounding the pavement. Jim used to say that he, he was the perspiration. Uh, I was the inspiration. I had the idea. And he's the guy who pounded the pavement to make it happen. And uh, when I talk to school kids, whether it's third graders or high school kids, uh, I always talk about you have to have that, that component. You have to have the dreamer, and then you have to have the other guy who, who recognizes the dreamer. But Jim, I used to describe, still do, as a dreamer with a deadline. And that was the magic of Big League Chew. It was a fun idea. We didn't come up with the idea to say, boy, we'll get rich with this. We, we had no idea what we had. and uh, But that's how it happened. One summer night, uh, 1977, and uh, 
Who knew? I mean, the first deal we had with Amaral Confections, which was the gimmick gum uh, branch of Wrigley. They made ouch bubble gum that looked like band-aids and bubble tape that looked like a tape measure. And, and then, of course, Big League Chew. Uh, it was all serendipity. There was no game plan. It's funny when I talk with business classes, they, they ask me questions, and I don't even know some of the terminology. It was just <laughs> a visceral kind of thing. Wouldn't this be fun? And I, 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 I mean, I, the, the Mount Rushmore of, of, of Big League Chew is certainly Todd Field because the first conversation I had with him, he, he wanted to put licorice in a pouch uh, a couple of years prior to my the, the inspiration for Big League Chew. Jim Bowden and Bing Russell and, and, and certainly Kurt Russell because Kurt was the fellow who, who convinced his dad to create an independent team. You know, Kurt was, still is a pretty famous actor almost 60 years in Hollywood. But we all, the commonality that all the people involved with Big League Chew had was we loved baseball. And I think that really comes through. When people first saw Big League Chew, friends of mine over the years, from, from junior college to, to the Ivies to summer ball, to a guy, they would say, man, this is a really fun idea. I hope the guy who created this makes a boatload of money. And they didn't even know it was me. It just They just thought, this is really fun. It had to be somebody who loved the game of baseball to come up with something so preposterous. So that was a bit of a long answer, but uh, that, that, here, we, here we are. That's perfect. That was a great answer. And um, it's, so much of it is so interesting. There's so much of it that I, I want to dig into a little bit. But the first thing I just want to ask is from there. So that was the first major – that was sort of where Big League Chew was born, was in the bullpen um, when you were speaking with Jim Bouton. And, and you, you know, admittedly just sort of got lucky that he was the right guy to talk to about it. But I'm interested to know when the first time you really had what, – what, do you remember – do you recall the first time you really had the idea for, for Big League Shoe? Because you said you had – you mentioned that you had mentioned to some other people before. What was – was there anything sort of behind it? Or did, did you just one day sort of come up with the idea on your own? I'm just curious as to, you know, maybe the, the very, very beginnings – the, the seedling uh, stages of Big League Chew when you first really uh, had the had the idea, had the picture in your mind uh, when you first first came up with it? It's a really good question, and, and it goes way back. Todd Field was a kid in my Little Maverick baseball school who was just enamored with the whole Maver Maverick mystique. He just thought the guys were great, the buzz around the stadium, and he just couldn't get enough of it. And he uh, ended up, uh, and he talks about it, and I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased and quite frankly proud of what he has to say in the documentary about how he became the Portland Maverick bat boy. Uh, because he had asked me, he said, Rob, I really want to become a bat boy. How can I do that? And I said, Todd, when they have the tryouts, there are going to be two or 300 guys there. They're going to need bat boys. Go there and just work your butt off. Do everything that none of the other bat boys are doing. You know, lining up the bats, just making sure everything is as good as it can be for the players. And Bing saw him doing that, and he waved them over. He was in the stands, you know, evaluating players during the trials, and uh, asked him what his name was, and he said, you got the job. I wish I had 10 kids like you. And, and it changed Todd's life. I mean, Todd's a writer, director in Hollywood now, Oscar-nominated. He's done some really great things, and he always credits the fact that he was a bad boy for the Little Mavericks, hanging around alleged grown-ups who were doing something they loved, irrespective of the fact that they were making almost no money. He said, that's what I wanted to do. He had two, two big dreams when he became a high school kid. He either wanted to play the trombone or become an actor. And, uh, and the Mavericks just inspired him to basically follow his bliss. You know, the way Joseph Campbell used to talk about it in the... Uh, and the power of myth, you know, you just follow your dream. And, and he had, he was in the clubhouse as a mad bad boy, and he had a, a bag of red man, and he was dipping in, putting this black stuff in his mouth. I said, Todd, what are you doing? He said, relax, Rob, it's just licorice. I chopped it up and threw it in the bag. And that was maybe 1975 or 76, probably. And I said, that's pretty interesting. And we talked about it a little bit, but not that much. And it was the following year when I went back for my third season with the Mavs, I said, you know, over the winter, I've been thinking about that licorice thing that you did. 
And you know, he's the time he's like 14 years old and he's got a hundred ideas, maybe a thousand. And I said, I don't think kids would chop on licorice during a ball game because you eat it, you swallow it. It's, it, it doesn't work. But I said, I think bubble gum would be, be cooler. I said, and I asked him, I said, what do you think? He said, yeah, you're probably right. But we really didn't dwell on it. We didn't think, oh, this would be a cool project. And, uh, it was only later in the summer of 77 that it really came to, to a head in my mind that, yeah, if we shred the gum and it was pink and or not even pink, I thought it was going to be brown. The first batch I made was root beer because I wanted it to look like red man. It's funny. When we went to Wrigley, they said, Rob, you're the idea guy. Leave the gum part to us. And they said, kids will not chew brown bubble gum. So I learned a lesson there. You know, one of the biggest things I think in this whole story is the reason I've had some luck in basically anything I've done is because I didn't know what I couldn't do. You know, I didn't have much of a business background. Even when I became a coach or a teacher, I just emulated the teachers and the coaches that I really respect and that I really like. And, you know, when you, when you, you Yogi Berry used to say, you can see a lot by looking around. And, and it sounds funny, but that, that really was the case. And the fact that Todd and I struck up this conversation was just total serendipity. And then when I said, it's got to be gum, Todd was so kind of dismissive of that. He said, yeah, you're probably right. And he, he had to go wash uniforms or do something. It wasn't like we had this aha moment. It was only when Bouton and I were there that I really put it together in my head. And it really was like, maybe this is bigger than I thought. And, and so there it was. The name Big League Chew, I think, is interesting because I go back to when I played summer baseball at St. John's University in the Atlanta Collegiate League, and I had a coach who became a top big league scout, a guy named Al Goldis. And I remember Al coming out to the outfield. We were shagging fly balls. Rick Wolf, who's a, a big publishing guy in New York City, uh, we just loved playing baseball. And Al said, I'm thinking of starting a baseball camp. Do you think I could call it the Major League Baseball Camp? And I said, Al, I, I, I don't think so. And I hesitated. I said, I bet you could call it the Big League Camp. And we left it at that. I don't even know if he ever did that. But that was in the early 70s, late 60s. Maybe. So I'm going fast forward another six or seven years. And I think the whole name Big League kind of resonated with me from that conversation that I had with Al Goldman. He's a big player in my life because he was really instrumental when I was at Nassau Community. I was a marginal left-hander, and, and Al, he just believed in me. I mean, truth be told, I started out at Marietta College, a D3 program. Uh, Don Shelley had a great D3 program. Now, one year I was a teammate with Ken Tocolvi, you know, who became 20, 19, 20 years in the big leagues. D3, great baseball Coach Shelley had said he needed a lot of left-handers, or he needed a left-hander, and I thought, well, I'll be the guy. But I wasn't as good as the other left-handers he'd recruited. And that's why I left. I went back to junior college, back to community college, lived at home, worked at JFK, United Airlines Air Freight, just doing these odds and ends. But my focus was always on how can I still pitch. When you think about it, I went from D3 to community college to the Ivy League and never lost a year of eligibility, which sounds like a really big deal, except for the fact that I was pretty abysmal my first three years. I think I won one game at Marietta at the freshman level, two games at Nassau, two games at Cornell my junior year. And then my senior year, you know, I made all Ivy second team. I uh, got hammered by Harvard, but I beat everybody else, shut out Princeton, beat Penn. I mean, I was just one of those things that eventually this thing is going to click. And uh, so, again, I'm kind of random here, but it, my focus was always on baseball. How can I stay in baseball? And I was, I think, sufficiently clever to realize that I wasn't going to do it with my arm. My brothers laugh now because my gum is in the Hall of Fame. You know, Big League Chew is the – the Hall of Fame public gum at Cooperstown. And they, they like to laugh. They say, Rob's gum is in the Hall of Fame because his arm certainly isn't. <laughs> and, and we all laugh about it. But it was, you know, it sounds random. And you mentioned earlier that, that it's got a Forrest Gump kind of component to it. Uh, that's absolutely on the mark. Everywhere I went, I met people who were willing to help me out. And some became big deals like Kurt Russell and Bing and Jim Bouton. And, and others are relatively anonymous, but important to me nonetheless. Yeah, and Todd Field is another one of those names that uh, 
it's just amazing that some of the people you've met and just what they've done with their lives and either before or after or, or you know while you while you had contact with them um I, i'd like to just discuss a little more about what happened from when you that this conversation with jim bouton to when it first hit the shelves because if i'm not mistaken you had the idea you had that conversation in 77 which was the last season right for the portland mavericks but then i i don't believe it hit the shelves until 1980 or at least that's what i read uh what what happened in the meantime i know you you were someone who was never afraid to kind of work some odd jobs and just kind of do whatever was necessary i don't know I, i'm curious to know like did you during that time did you know that big league chew was it like was that the focus and you kind of just had to do whatever was necessary to bridge the gap until that happened or were you looking for a new career at that point not knowing what what would happen with big league show i'm very very interested in that that couple those couple years there between you know that, that first handshake and when it first hit the shelves it's a really good question and, and nobody's ever really asked that before because it is like a two-year gap as luck would have it i had met john paulson who's the fellow who created the jokes pitching machine company my goal was to play winter ball back in South Africa and come back to Portland for as long as they would have me. So I had visited him in the summer of 75 and asked him if I could sell pitching machines in Cape Town and elsewhere in South Africa. And, and we worked out an agreement. And, uh, and then because I didn't make the team, I started the Little Maverick Baseball School. I went back to Mr. Paulson and said, could I borrow a couple? pitching machines i've got a baseball day camp on my hands and i'm sold out for three weeks in a row because the media just embraced the camp and and he said sure uh, and the reason i bring up john paulson was because in the summer of 77 he called me uh and said hey bro it's john paulson look i saw you pitch last night and i think maybe in september you ought to come work for me and we both laughed about that <laughs> because I said, are you connecting those two things? He said, no, I just know you got the off season. So long story short, I went to work for the Jugs Pitching Machine Company, and I became his one-man advertising agency. Uh, it was obvious to Mr. Paulson and to me that we were kindred spirits. He had a small company that was about a year old. Uh, no, that's not true. I guess it's about five years old, but it was only doing about $2 million in sales. And I... Uh, he had asked me what I thought about some of the things he had done. I made some two suggestions. Use more coaches and fewer salespeople. I said, because let's face it, you've got 10 items. It's not that hard to learn how to sell the whole catalog of junk stuff. I said, if we can find high school and college coaches who want to be involved with this, uh, it's going to be a grassroots effort. Because you need coaches who are going to be enthused about teaching other coaches why this machine is good for throwing curveballs in the dirt so your your catchers can work on, on defending those. And so I did that for 30 years, as it turned out. Even when Big League Chew became a big deal, I still stay, stayed in marketing and advertising for, for John Paulson and, uh, and uh, the Joe's Pitching Machine people. So that's what I was doing those first two years. Jim contacted me in 78. He said, Rob, I'm not having any success. People don't seem to understand it. You've got to make some gum. And, and uh, I said, okay. And I didn't know what was going to happen. January of 79, I'm reading an article in People magazine. And there's a fellow from Arlington, Texas, who's making make your own bubblegum kits. I bought a case of the stuff. And we went to Todd Field's kitchen. Uh, his mom, Candy Field. It's a preposterous name, but she, she also should be on that Mount Rushmore because Mrs. Field let me use the... Uh, her kitchen, because typical ball player, you know, we had a coffee machine and a toaster and four guys in an apartment. <laughs> Mrs. Field let me use her kitchen, and we uh, we made the first batch of Big League Chew. Again, it seems like out of a movie. We made the first batch on February 6th, 1979, and doing some work with the Jugs Company, I was trying to sell buy some ad space for Babe Ruth Baseball's uh, equipment catalog, and the back cover of the catalog of a past catalog had a brief history of Babe Ruth. And sure enough, the birth, his birthday is February 6th, I think 1895, somewhere around there. And I, and I said, I remember that date. And I went back and I, I can't find it now, but I had a piece of loose leaf paper. I had 
The whole Field family signed it. They were witnesses to the first batch of Big League Chew. That should be in the Smithsonian, in fact, you never find it. <laughs> but sure enough, it was it was February sixth in Mrs. Field's kitchen. And uh and, and so I made the batch of the stuff and sent it to Jim, and he said, this is going to be good enough. It tastes awful. At the time, I was also the pitching coach at Portland State under the, the great Jack Dunn, the wily mentor of the great Northwest. I did that for two seasons, and they, they eventually dropped baseball at PSU. Just budget cuts and things happened. But he was a great guy, but when I brought the first, the first batches of Big League Chew to the Portland State Viking team, Every guy said, Rob, this is a great idea. But nobody said, this is really good gum. <laughs> because what, what, I made, what I made wasn't particularly good. But the guys were awesome. They, they said, yeah, no, he, you know, he's, he's just kind of out there, you know, left-hander and, and, and all that. And, and then, of course, it was uh, a year later, January 1, 1980, they, they, they rolled the presses, so to speak, and those pouches went out. The rest is history. I mean, we had a three-year deal with Wrigley that after year one, when they sold $18 million uh, worth of gum, in the, the year before they, the Wrigley family sold the Cubs for $22 million, they knew they had something pretty special there. So the three-year deal went away, and now here we are over 40 years later. You know, you mentioned earlier that we've sold over 800 million pouches. Uh, next year, probably by the end of next year, we're, we're going to top a billion, a billion pouches, which, which to me is just preposterous. <laughs> That's amazing. So, that, just what a so, feeling that must be for you to just think about that number. How many people have chewed big league chew? Like, I don't know. I can't imagine anybody who's ever played baseball for any period of time, you know, hasn't chewed big league chew uh, uh, among just, you know, just random people, you know, people that haven't played. I'm sure I've heard of it. I don't know if this is, I'm sure this is a story that you've heard a thousand times, but uh, I, I mentioned to you in some of our previous conversation that I used to coach college baseball. And as a, as a college coach, I was, um, I, I, you know, like every baseball person, I had some superstitious type stuff. And I used to do a thing where like when, when we needed to score runs, I had certain ways to kind of get a rally going. Like, you know, players, when they're not going well, they, they're, They'll pull their, you know, pull the pull the pants up higher so they're showing their socks, or have, or, you know, if they usually have high socks, they'll pull their pants down to their, uh, the bottom of the pants down to the spikes, or would it just go with the long pants, or whatever, you know, wear batting gloves or change batting gloves. Well, I, as a coach, as a college, a Division One college coach, mind you, Rob, when our team needed some runs, this is a this is the honest to God truth. I had, um, I had ground ball grape in my bag, and when we needed a rally, I would go to ground ball grape, and I would let the players, like between innings, the guys that were due up, I would show them that, hey, this is happening. Like, we're going to score runs this inning, and I, I promise you that more more times than not, we scored when I put it in. So, like, guys, the, the guys in the team going forward, when we needed something, sometimes they're looking at me like, coach, you got any ground ball grape in there? Like, don't worry, I got it. I'm going to get some going here. And, and uh, it's just I, I can't imagine that there aren't – thousands of people that have told you stories like that but that's the honest to god truth and same like i told you with my kids before we started recording my kids my this is way before you and i ever spoke but my little kids we play wiffle ball in the backyard they refer to bigly chew as baseball gum that's just that's what it is to them that that is baseball gum and they were so they were so uh uh, shocked that i was talking with you today that uh they were they were really impressed by it but i can you is there like one do you have one or two stories that maybe stick out to you through the years of people telling you something about Big League Chew that just made you sort of almost sit back and say, like, wow, this is – I can't believe you just told me that story, like, I, that that happened to me and, and my product. Is there anything that stands out to you? Well, you know, it, it, everybody, it seems to me, has, has a Big League Chew story. It could be a, a server at a restaurant in Chicago or a bartender or somebody, you know, in Oregon that – can't pump your own gas, but somebody who's pumping my gas, and and they'll see the big league chew on my on my seat. They say, "Oh man, I love that stuff!" And you know, so I can. Halloween, of course, is big time here in Portland because I'm giving out a couple of hundred pouches of the thing. Uh, everybody seems to have a story. One of my favorite ones is Corey Seager, who only somebody did a, an article on what's in Corey Seager's cubicle, and uh, they went to Dodger Stadium, and he had, I guess, four sleeves of original big league chew. It's like almost 50 bags of gum. And whoever was doing the article said, what's with the original only? He said, when I was in high school, all I chewed was ground ball grape. And it became tournament time, and all he was hitting were ground balls. 
And he said, I haven't touched it since then. I'm an original <laughs> big league chick guy. I mean, he's a major league player, you know. So you, you think it's wacky being a D1 coach and, you know, you're pulling your socks up and down and chewing or not chewing big league chew ground ball grapes. This guy's a bona fide big leaguer, potential Hall of Famer, and he only goes with original big league chew. I love that stuff. It just it makes me smile. It's sometimes... You know, when my dad had retired from the police force and they moved to Connecticut, he would go to convenience stores, and if Big Lee Chew was like on a lower shelf, he would move it up a couple of spaces, and my <laughs> mom would say, Harold, you're going to get kicked out of the store. This is embarrassing. He said, oh, these people need to know this is a local guy. You know, so everybody, you know, and the funny thing about Big Lee Chew stories is they're not all, I, I, I stuck some Big Lee Chew in my mouth and I hit a triple and the Massive People Little League won the title, that kind of thing. It, it's not like that. Some, there are guys who have stories saying, man, I had that big league chew, I went up and I got hit in the head. You know, it's, just, <laughs> it's just, it brings memories and it really, big league chew really does lead the league in smiles. When people see it, it just, for whatever reason, it makes them happy. And that makes me happy. You know, as an educator, as a teacher, as a coach, you, you want to be, upbeat you know you want to be uplifting to people and and all i've got to do is, is <laughs> break out a, a 12 pack of big league chew and, and mayhem and and, and sues. uh so so that's my favorite one with, with Corey seager but i cannot tell you i'm guessing one person out of a thousand i said geez i'm not familiar with it. you know it's just it is i can't think of anything like it. my brother and then said you know when you think about your shred drop you take it out of the pouch and you put it in your hand if you ask anybody what's in my hand here they're going to say it's big league chew he said you can't do that with a with a glass of coca-cola it could be a dr pepper it could be a root beer you don't know he said there are very few products that unlabeled you you know exactly what it is other companies have tried to come up with some variation on it but i i, I kind of believe in karma and, and the big league chew I think is a success now because I moved over to Ford Gum in Western New York, near Buffalo. Uh, when Mars bought out Wrigley, I realized that that was going to be a mega company and a niche brand like mine was probably better off with a smaller, more nimble company. Guys in Western New York, I had teammates from the Buffalo area uh, when I was at Cornell and I knew that the Buffalo is where they filmed the natural to where Warren Spahn grew up. I just had a good feeling about the Buffalo area. And it's the little factory that, that could. I mean, they, they have just nailed it. They understand the passion that people have for Big League Chew. And, uh, you know, I'm like the Otami of, uh, of, of bubblegum. And not like I'm pitching and I'm batting fourth because uh, uh, we're almost 50% of the company. Ford Gum makes a lot of other private label stuff and a few licensed things. But probably 45% of it is, is Big League Chew. So I landed, again, the Forrest Gum thing. I landed with George Steggy, who runs the company, uh, and, and his his band of believers there, and, and it's just they love the fact that they work at the Big League Shoe Factory. In the beginning, I felt like Charlie Bucket, like I won the golden ticket. <laughs> you know, I was in my tw I was twenty nine when it came out, and you know, a month later I was thirty. So it was like I, I was an alleged grown up. But it's funny being Charlie Bucket. Uh, for a very long time, and now I'm in my 70s, and, and I feel like Gene Wilder, like I've morphed into Mr. Walker, now, you know, so <laughs> I've got kind of the, the full circle on the thing, but the magic is still there. I, I, I think you can tell that I'm as crazy about Big League Chew as, as I've ever been, and it's, you know, obviously it's lucrative, and it, it's a fun business to be in. I've got three kids, two almost 18-year-olds, and one almost 22 years old, and we talk about it a lot. They are going to be running the company when I uh, finally decide not to do what I do. But quite frankly, it's just so much fun. My kids are going to have to wait a while. So, but, uh, you know, there it is. It's just, it's a dream come true. And I can't believe my luck. And when you talk about, you know, being a college coach and, and bringing some uh, lightness to the thing. All right, I'm chewing this gum. We're going to score three runs. When it happens, everybody laughs. And when it doesn't happen, everybody forgets about it. <laughs> you know, and, and that's cool, too. You know, we, we stick to the upbeat stuff. I, I love the story, and um, I, I want to keep 
asking you more as as we talk. There's more and more things I want to ask you about. You kind of mentioned you mentioned your dad there being in the convenience store, moving the gum up. Like obviously he was not shy about um, you know doing things like that and and just you know promoting his son. Do you tell people who you are? Like when you you go to you're at you're at a, a gas station and somebody sees Big League Chew in your car and they say, "Hey, I love that stuff." Do you do you offer that up of who you are, or do you like to have some anonymity where you just yeah, it's pretty good stuff. I, I bet the guy that made that's a real, a real, you know, I bet he's a real great guy. Do you, do you tell people who you are up front or do you just like, do you let people kind of figure it out on their own? I, it's much more fun if they can figure it out on their own. Uh, you know, and, and occasionally it, it's just kind of so obvious. I'll say, yeah, I, I, I got lucky a long time ago, but for the most part, no. I mean, at Halloween, of course, everybody knew the big yellow house was the bubblegum house when we lived there. And, uh, and, and that was fun too, and particularly when the parents would say, oh, "Man, there's the guy!" And I, you know, I'd raise my left arm and throw it, you know, sixty feet six inches at, uh, you know, eight miles an hour to the moms or the dads and say, "That's not just for kids anymore." And I think the parents are as excited to get a pouch of gum from basically Mr. Wonka uh, as I am giving it out. You know, it's just, it's one of the things. The gum has allowed me to meet some really interesting people. You know, the Ripken brothers and I are tight. And, and, and Kurt Russell, of course, is superstar in Hollywood for 60 years. Guys like Sean Casey, uh, all the guys who I love, Buster Posey is another one. The, the guys that you meet, they are so excited to be hanging out with a low minor leaguer who kind of, you know, got the brass ring. But we all have the secret handshake, and the secret handshake is that we love baseball. But, but the, all of those people that I talk about, there's a certain sense of, of – of self-effacing humility. I mean, being a, having breakfast with Kurt Russell on the road in Bellingham, Washington, when a waitress would come up and say, one of the cooks says one of you guys is famous. And Kurt would say, well, we're with the Portland Mavericks. We're playing Bellingham tonight, and uh, we're going to kick their butts. So why don't you come out and watch? He never big leagues. He never, he never made a big deal out of the fact that he was kind of an American icon. And it's a good lesson from that. You know, my, my, my dad had a lot of great sayings, but the, the one he always said was, uh, it's amazing what you can accomplish when nobody cares who gets the credit. And uh, so it's been easy for me to kind of talk about Dan Chernoff and Jim Bowden and Todd Field and all the people who made it happen. Uh, and the reason I do that is because that's the truth. I mean, it, it took a village for Big League Chew to become a reality, and I'm always mindful of that. Being the youngest of three brothers, and my two older brothers are very cool guys, and, uh, you know, they've been giving me noogies since I was six years old, uh, <laughs> telling me to behave. And so, you know, you have to have a, a bit of that humility. But it's fun. You know, and then when the light bulb finally goes on, when I've gone to the same place for gas, and they say, wait a minute, you're the gum guy, right? You know, it's so, so it's, it, it, it's fun. That's uh, all I can say is it, it, it's fun. You know, I've got this dopey grin on my face whenever, whenever I'm talking about the brand, and, uh, and I still have it. And you can hear it. You can hear the passion in every every interview <laughs> yeah, well, I've had with you. Even the conversations we've had where we weren't recording, it just seems like you have so much fun with it. And it's so – it's refreshing, honestly. It's one of the reasons I wanted to talk with you is because you're obviously really passionate about about what you're doing. This episode, okay. of, this episode of Figured Out Baseball Podcast is brought to you by Crossover Symmetry. Baseball players, if you want to increase your velocity without losing command or you want to throw out runners from any position on the field, check out – armcare.com developed by crossover symmetry armcare.com measures your arm strength and delivers customized prep strength and recovery training based off of what you need most that day gain velocity through targeted training while also having your best stuff every game armcare.com is used at every level of baseball play by players who want an advantage over their competition and take their health and performance seriously go to armcare.com and get started today rob the next thing um I mean, obviously, when when figured out, or when uh, I'm sorry, when Big League Chew started to really become something, you know, when it when it first hit the shelves, and obviously that first year, it didn't take ten years for it to sell. Like, it, I mean, it sold a lot that first year. How did life change for you? Because you were a guy from everything I've read and heard about you and the things we've talked about, you were never somebody who was out to make a lot of money. You just had things that you liked to do and you, and you did whatever was necessary to make ends meet. But all of a sudden, obviously 
you know, things changed in, in a big way. I, I'm curious to know just from your, you know, from, from your mouth and just how, how things change within your, your family or for you personally, how did things change when big league chew became big league chew? And it, it, you know, it was, it was a big seller. It was, uh, it created a lot of revenue really quickly. How did, how did life change for you at that point? Again, I'll go, I'll go back to what my brother Harry calls dad one oh one. Uh, when it first started coming out, there was a lot of ripples of, of you know, publicity in Sports Illustrated, Wall Street Journal, and so forth. And, and my dad was ta- – I was talking about it going out to, to dinner in New York City with Jim Bouton, how people would put menus in his face and sign and so forth because he was a Yankee, a World Series hero, and, and all those things. And, and my dad said uh, – and I said, it, it's interesting, but it's taxing for somebody like that. And my dad said, you know, it's probably cool to be rich and famous, but probably better to be comfortable and anonymous. <laughs> and, and that, and that always stayed with me that, that it, it, it's just better, better that way. And I remember driving my, my daughter Paige to a tennis match. Uh, and I've got a Volkswagen Golf and just out of the blue, she said, you know, dad, I really like, I like the fact that you drive a Volkswagen. And, uh, and I knew what she meant. Uh, I knew what you meant. It, it's this, I don't know. We, we, when, when you grow up, Massapequa was a great town. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld grew up there. All the Baldwin brothers grew up there. It, it was a town that uh, I heard uh, Alec Baldwin describe, I think it was on Fresh Air, growing up in Massapequa, South Shore of Long Island, right next to Amityville, the more famous town than Massapequa, uh, until Alec got big and Jerry got big. But he said it was a town where a lot of guys moved from from Brooklyn or Queens, there were policemen, firemen, sanitation workers, school teachers, and they all had three to five kids, and they all found some way to get them all through college. And so it was a really cool place to be uh, in, in a very real, almost it's a wonderful life uh, kind of way. So it just wasn't our style coming from that town to, to become a big shot. It, it, just, it just didn't work that way. My baseball coach, Don Lang, is who I wanted to be, Mr. Lang. The high school opened in the early 60s and then closed down after population shifts. He's the only baseball coach they ever had. He was there for 40-plus years. And he was a minor league catcher and, again, another guy that we just hit it off. And uh, he taught me a lot about not only how to play the game, but how to, how to be a regular guy. And when you when you hang around people who've had some luck and, and they don't get full of themselves, uh, it makes it easier. You know, going out and having a beer with Bill Ripken near the MLB network, you know, some people come over and talk to him, and he's just never dismissive. It's just like, you know, just happy to be here. And it's almost like Crash Davis, you know, the speech that he gives at the end of Bull Durham to Nuke Lelouch, where you just say, I'm just happy to be here. You know, good Lord willing, things will work out. <laughs> and uh, it keeps, it, it's a lot easier when you're focused on the stuff that matters. I will say what when it happened with Dad retiring as a, a police officer, uh, able to, to do some things for my parents that every guy would, would love to do for, for their mom and dad. And uh, just small stuff like that. Uh, just, But again, kind of under the radar. And uh, it, it's it's much more fun that way, believe me. It's a, you know, it, it, I'm not trying to come across as Joe Humble, but it's just it simplifies your life when, when you're not uh, – there are no bells and whistles. I don't have an entourage. Plus, I have three kids – who uh, keep me humble every day. So that's a good thing. Kids are good for that. Whether you're the big league chew guy or, or whether you're a school teacher, kids will always find a way to humble their parents, right? Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> um, can I ask you also, I, I hate to spend too much time on the sort of the beginnings of big league chew, but I, I'm really interested because I think anybody – that has started a business before and I'll even throw figured out baseball into that category. Um, you know, the beginning, you're just not sure what, what things are going to look like. You you have no idea how it's going to go, if it's going to flop, if it's going to be a huge success. At what point, Rob, did you realize if you can recall the first time you just, you sort of had the thought that, Oh my gosh, like this, this could really be something was, was it when the deal was made with Wrigley? Was it, uh, was it before that? Was it after that? At what point did you really think that this could become something pretty big? You know, I don't know if I ever came to that point. I mean, I stayed with the Jugs Company for 30 years doing advertising uh, in a baseball-related area. I love going to the college coaches' conference, representing you know a company that I really respected. 
and making great baseball stuff. I was able to continue my baseball life. I could go back to Cape Town. I went to Sydney. I finished up in my late 40s pitching in the British National League. And I felt really lucky that I was playing at a competitive level where I was as good or maybe a little better than some of the guys. But the games really mattered. It wasn't like I was in a Sunday beer league. Like to win the British Championship in 91 and 94 was a really big deal. Same thing in Cape Town, being on a couple of national championship teams. So those small goals never really changed. The, you know, the, and I, I just, I just, it's hard to believe, I suppose, that I never really saw it as like, wow, well, we've really got it made now. Because, you know, we've got the three kids, put them through college and, and all that kinds of stuff. It's, I like dealing with with the everyday, and I think because I, that's all I was around growing up. Uh, my little league coach, Mr. Quinn, Joe Quinn, NYPD detective. Uh, I, that seemed to be that's where I'm rooted. I mean, I, I will go way back. 19, 1964, I played in what was called Senior Little League in Massapequa. It was a four-team league. There were 60 kids in the league. You had a 30% chance to make the All-Star team. They picked 18 guys for the All-Stars. <laughs> Every game was at Carmen Road School. You played on Tuesday or Thursday, and the 10 o'clock game or the 1 o'clock game on Saturday. If I pitched on Tuesday, I went to Carmen Road School. It was about a half a mile from where I lived. I walked over there to watch the other two teams play. I was scouting even then. You know, I was 15 years old. But that team... Mr. Quinn and the mayor of Massapequa, Andy Sinise Sr., were our two coaches. And they picked an all-star team, and we ran the table. We won the Senior Little League World Series. With a four-team league, it was travel ball meant take your bike or walk to Carmen Road School. And we we beat Branham, Texas, just outside of Houston. We beat uh, a team from Iowa, and we beat Monterey, Mexico. We were at the Louisville Fairgrounds in Kentucky. It's the only year they ever held the Senior World Series there. Uh, you know, it's like eight or 10,000 people. It was just, it was like out of a film. It was crazy to be, and again, the reason I bring it up is that it's like a small town kind of guy who, who doesn't you know, fall in love with the big time kind of thing. It's not like I was Elvis giving away Cadillacs to anybody I knew kind of thing. We just kind of stayed, gra stayed grounded. One of the fun stories about that Little League team was before we got to Louisville, in the Eastern Regionals, we had a right-handed pitcher, an extraordinary right-hander, Richie Zoll. He threw 12 innings in a game at Princeton University. We're playing Willingboro, New Jersey. The 12 innings ends, and we're tied. I have to throw the last six innings the next day. It's an 18-inning game, and as luck would have it, we win one nothing on a pass ball. <laughs> and that's how we ended up going to, to Louisville. And again, just the, those memories stay with me. I mean, I'm, I'm 72 now, so we're looking at 57 years ago, you know, that that happened. But I do remember the only game my dad saw me pitch for Cornell was at Princeton University. And I remember phoning my dad, like, on the Tuesday before the weekend. And I said, Dad, I'm pitching the second game against Princeton on Saturday. And uh, Master Pico was not that far from New Jersey. He drove over. And I threw a shutout against Princeton. And I said to my dad, you know, I haven't given up a run at Princeton yet. And uh, I think you should come. This is going to be good. And just every line drive got caught. I think I threw 62 pitches in a seven-inning game. Wow. It was just, just absolute, you know, good fortune. Again, it seems to me like my whole life, is, I feel like I've been pitching with a 10-run lead. I just always had a good catcher and guys who turn double plays. So I think baseball teaches that to you, that – uh, you know, I, I always wanted to be the next Whitey Ford. My license plate on my Volkswagen is one six O N E S I X, and it's a tribute to Whitey Ford. And my friends say, "How many seven-year-old guys have a license plate as an, an homage to their favorite player in the big leagues?" I said, <laughs> "Probably not enough." But anyway, that whole idea of being part of a community in baseball, where uh, you may not have your best stuff, but you've got your team behind you. It keeps you keeps you humble because line drives get caught and broken bats lose games for you. And uh, uh, if I had to pick one thing, I'd say, how did this whole thing happen? I'd say it was because I became a ball player. And I just learned that failure is a part of baseball and it's a part of life. And so is luck. And no lefty 
luckier than I. You've got such an unbelievable memory for names and <laughs> dates. I, I just, that's one of the things I've been really, really impressed with you uh, about. I mean, among many other things, I, I think that your, your true humbleness is really, it's, it's great to hear because not many people are in your position and, and are just kind of a regular guy uh, like you are. Uh, for you know, there's no reason for anybody to know this, but Rob and I actually connected on social media, um, like I do with a lot of podcasts. And uh, here's a guy that we sort of interacted with. Uh, something happened in baseball. Rob commented, or I, or I commented, and then we commented on each other's comment. And it was like, hey, are you really, you're really the the founder, the the creator of Big League Chew? Because you know, you don't not like you have thirty five thousand followers on on Twitter. And you said, yeah, I'm really the guy. And, and it was funny to me that uh, the official Big League Chew Twitter account also responded and said, "Yep, this is the guy." And you and I just sort of started talking. And you know how many how many guys in your profile would even do that? Uh, that's that part's pretty amazing to me. But also, you know, really, Rob, the your your memory is unbelievable. Can I just can I ask if uh, that's probably something that no one's ever asked you either? What's your secret to that? Do you have some sort of a daily routine or things that you do just to? to stay as energetic and as sharp as you are? I think growing up in our, you know, we, our family led the league in fun. You know, we, we were the Nelsons when Ozzie and Harriet Nelson were on TV. And people used to say that the Nelsons are the real life Ozzie and Harriet. We were just kind of an upbeat collection. A thing came up about two weeks ago because this month is the 30th anniversary of the Enfield Spartans uh, in England, beating the London Warriors in a best of three uh, <laughs> a series. And our catcher, Gary Benningfield, is, is online, who is a great author about baseball in wartime. Talk about a guy with memory. He is just, and one of the greatest catchers I've ever uh, thrown to. And they were talking about the game, and I would say, I uh, actually know it was the third game, and uh, Oscar Marcelino hit a triple, and Robin Ewell cut the ball in left field, and Steve Simmons, our second baseman, says, do you have notes? How do you remember this stuff? And, and I said to him, I said, you know, when I pitched in, uh, 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 in the 90s for, for, for a team in Britain with a great collection of guys, they, they were like the Portland Mavericks of England, just a great collection of guys. I said I was so grateful to be in my middle 40s, and somebody still gave me the ball every Sunday and said, go out and throw nine. I couldn't believe my luck. And I think, you know, for a lot of guys, it's, you know, there's one big moment in their life, and I don't like a thousand of them. And I don't know why I remember them. I probably can't tell you what I had for breakfast, but I can tell you that, that Benningfield caught the curveball in the dirt and threw out Holly Heidecker by an eyelash, and we won the championship in, in 94. And everybody thinks I'm making these names up, but I'm not. And I can't explain it. I, my brother Harry is the same way. My brother Ed was, he went to the dark side and played lacrosse. And he remembers a couple of things, mostly about the post-game celebrations. So there's that too. But but Eddie used to say, he said, yeah, these aren't real people, are they? So I'm telling you, Ollie Heidecker was a German player, played for London, couldn't hit the curveball. And who knows? I have no answer for it, you know. But, uh, but I'm grateful. I, I, I suppose I can shoot back my mom and dad because... Uh, you know, it's genetics, just dumb luck. So do you consider yourself, Rob, a baseball guy? Do you consider yourself the big league chew guy? And I'm asking because I just, you know, kind of how you self-identify. I'm a financial planner. I haven't coached college baseball for, uh, let's see, six or seven years now. But I still consider myself a baseball guy. I just that's kind of how I think about myself. How do you think about yourself when you just, when you sort of self-identify? What is your... Uh, I guess what what if if I can say this, what label would you, do you give yourself, or how do you think about yourself just on a day to day basis? You know, I, I, if I had to pick one thing, I'd say I, I, I think like a left hander. You know, I kind of look at the world a little bit differently. Clearly, clearly, I'm a baseball guy, and even though I don't know a lot of the names of the players and stuff, I'll see something and I'll send a text to Bill Ripken and say that, you know, there was a catcher's interference in 1956 similar to this. You may want to bring it up in the broadcast. And, you know, he'll, he'll text me back and say, are you making that up or is that real? I'll say, no, that really happened, you know. And uh, when Harvey Haddock threw the perfect game, they, they, one guy, Joe Adcock, passed first base, and that's why it was a one nothing score. It's that part of me, the baseball part of me, will always stay with me. I'm, I'm just fascinated with that stuff. And because Big League Chew is, as your kids say, the baseball gum, 
it, it, it is my heart and soul. I play a lot of doubles tennis, and, and my partner field, to me, is like a pitcher and a catcher. You know, in terms of communicating, when are you going to throw a curveball serve? You're going to, are you going to go wide? And I love, I love that dynamic. So I think because baseball was the first thing I really loved uh, more than anything I could imagine. I think that stays, that stays with me. I just wrapped up this past summer, the 35th summer of running the Southampton Baseball School, a baseball day camp, five mornings of, of baseball for a hundred bucks in the Hamptons. Nobody could believe that we would do it. And, of course, we didn't make any money. I love the fact that the last five or six years, every coach in my camp at one time was a kid in the camp. It was it was just magical. And I just – there's something about the game that lends itself to just carrying on. I did a thing about a month ago with the History Channel, and they're doing the history of fun food from the 80s. And one of the episodes is going to be about Big League Chew. I mean, they came out here – and, and and they interviewed Mrs. Field. We went to the kitchen where we made the first batch of Big League Chew. Wow. Uh, we went to the ballpark where the bullpen used to be. It's a soccer-specific stadium now for, for Portland's Timbers. Uh, but it was just so much fun. And, and when they were asking me questions about how it all happened, I, I didn't have to use any notes. It was It's one of those things when, when you've had so many great days in your life, you just want to hold on to as much of it as, as you can. And so, so to answer that question, yeah, I'm definitely a baseball guy and uh, probably always will be. There's so many unique parts of this story and how all of it came together and the people that you've met, even the people, I'm, I'm sure there are people that you haven't even gotten to, but just the, the amazing people that you've met because of Big League Chew, it's, it's really incredible. Ha, has there been discussion at any point of making a movie about just the origins of Big League Chew or telling this story and just uh, almost the, you know, the Rob Nelson story? Has that ever, has anybody ever talked about that? You know, we've had discussions about maybe like a, uh, uh, a young adult book because so much of it is, is it's kind of inspirational that, you know, you're in eighth grade and you really don't know what to do with your life. And that was me. You know, until I was almost 30, you know. So there's been that. I do think if anything ever ever happens in terms of a film, uh, it'll be from the eyes of Todd Field because, you know, he knows how to do it. Uh, the other guys who I might be able to work with, I know I'd be able to work with, are the Way Brothers, the fellows who created uh, not only the Battered Bastards of Baseball, but but other documentaries. And they are the grandsons of, of Ben Russell. So if anybody ever wanted to do that it would be people people that i know and a lot of it is hard to describe i mean i wrote a letter in 75 uh my first year with the Mavs to bill veck he was still owning he still owned the white Sox, and i wrote to him and said that i've always admired your work and and i've read all your books and i knew that bill veck and i shared the same birthday february 9th you know john crook bill veck and me <laughs> you know, and so it's like an interesting trio there but I had I'd written to him and I, and I said that I'm going to be going through Chicago to catch a few ball games. My my best friend from college days, third baseman Tom Betcher, lives in Highland Park, and we were going to go watch a few games. I said I'd like to come by and just say hello and thank you because you've really made baseball fun for me. And I got a postcard back from Bill Beck, and he said, "Here's a number. When you're coming into Chicago, give a call here, and uh, I'd, I'd love to get to meet you." And, and this is like out of a movie because the season ends. It's right after Labor Day. I phoned Chicago at the number that Bill Vec had given me. And the voice says, White Sox. And I said, Bill Vec, please. And he said, speak it. I mean, it just, <laughs> <laughs> imagine the owner of a team sends me a postcard with his phone number on it. And I said, I'm Rob. I'm the guy from Portland. He said, no, I'd love to have you. And, and uh, <laughs> Tom and I got to meet Bill Vec for like maybe 30 seconds. And I, I just couldn't believe it. I told that story to Mike then. He was giving a speech in Seattle, and I went up to see him. And uh, and he said, you know, I just recently, if I remember this right, and I may have this part wrong, but he said, I recently got remarried. Would you tell this story to my wife? Because she hears all these stories about my dad. And unfortunately, she never got to meet him. And, and so I did. But he said, thanks for sharing that, because that is so typically my dad. 
that you know what I just couldn't get over when when I said Bill Beck please and he said speaking <laughs> yeah, I said to my brothers it's like calling Yankees and say uh, New York Yankees George Steinbrenner please yeah this is George <laughs> what can I do for you you know I just finished reading uh, our team. Luke Eplin's book about the Cleveland Indians in 1948, and it's about Bill Beck, Larry Doby, uh, Satchel Paige, and Bob Feller, and it's magnificent. Truth be told, I, I listened to it on Audible, and it's spectacular. But listening to those Bill Beck stories, I just wish I had been a good friend of his because we just seem to have so much in common that the game is fun more than anything else. And, of course, he won his, his share of games and a couple of championships. But more than it, you know, I had a thing recently. I quote, I, I responded to somebody on Twitter talking about the emphasis on winning and so forth. And I was talking about the difference between coaches and kids. And, and the one thing I said was that winning matters, playing matters more, and fun matters most. And it's just off the top of my head. And other people have used that quote and they've asked me, where'd you get that from? I said, I just plucked it out of the air. But but I think that is the mantra that I've had. I've had enough winning experiences that, that really matter to me. When I think of baseball, I think about the fun. And I, and I think about getting the opportunity to pitch. When I would go to a new country, when, when I went from South Africa to Australia, I didn't go to the top team. I go to a team that needed a starting pitcher because playing really mattered to me. And if you blend those three things, you know, winning, playing, and the fun factor, you know, that's that's kind of the story of my life, I suppose. Just like out of a movie. <laughs> What's yeah, the, yeah, it, it really is. If I can just ask a couple more things before we wrap up, I know we're probably pushing it for time here. Rob, what's one thing that people, you, you've told your story, I'm sure, thousands of times. What's one thing that you wish more people knew about you? Wow. Uh, I think I'm a pretty good friend to a lot of people. Uh, and I think I'm a pretty good dad. I think my kids and I have a, uh, have a good friendship, a sense of give and take. Uh, you know, the, the whole, I mean, this, between my brother and my brother Harry and me, we're kind of, the Nelson brothers all and I, we're, we're, it's kind of, you know, do good, be kind kind of thing. It's almost a cliche, but there have been a lot of opportunities to do some nice things under the radar. And I just like to be known as a nice guy. And I think that that would, that would really make me happy. I think my kids would say, our dad's a little out there, but he's a good guy. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you can't do better than that, you know. I love that, and I think that's a great place to wrap it up. This is Rob Nelson, everyone. Uh, what an enjoyable podcast. We're here with the creator of Big League Chew, which is, uh, you know, I was a little bit starstruck coming into this one, to be honest. I had a, a lunch with my dad today and just said I'm a little bit nervous about this one. I don't, I don't normally get nervous for podcasts, but I wasn't sure how this one was going to go. You've done so many of these things. I, I really kind of felt like I was going to be under a microscope today and hope that I would live up to some of these other, the podcasts and the interviews you've done. I mean, you've just done some really amazing things. Among all the other things we've talked about, you've been featured in the Washington Post, Esquire. Obviously, you, you were in the battered bastards of baseball and, and just, you know, everybody and everybody has interviewed you or, or written something or had you on a podcast. And uh, I, I'm just, I'm very, very grateful that you, uh, we're so willing to do this. The first time I brought it up to you, it was immediate like, yeah, let's let's do this. And we found a date. It took us a couple weeks to find a date, but we did it. And um, I, I'll be honest, this was this was very just personally enjoyable for me. Um, it's cool to hear someone like you and, and your story, all the things that you've been through. Uh, so I just want to personally say thank you for taking the time out of your day to come and be on a podcast with someone like me on a, on a small platform like Figured Out Baseball. It, it means a great deal. So thank you very much, Rob, for your time. Hey, absolutely my pleasure. You're really good at this. And uh, I don't know how long you've been doing it, but this is it's like sitting in the living room and just shooting the breeze. It was really fun. And I appreciate the airtime. Let's face it, you know, business is business. Like, the more people know about the gum uh, the better off my kids are going to be. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. This has really been cool, Tim. I'd, I'd stand on the hilltops and scream about Big League Chew if I thought anybody would listen. Uh, and it's good to hear you say <laughs> I appreciate the compliment of how well this went for you. Uh, my I was a, my degrees in journalism, and I, I obviously I coached baseball, and now I'm a financial planner. 
I don't use my degree much, but I use it in these podcasts. So my, my journalism professors will be thrilled to death to hear that compliment as well as my parents who helped pay for the education and, and had a, a very strange look on their face when I told them that when I was graduating, I wasn't going to get a job as a writer. I was going to coach college baseball and, and have about four part-time jobs to make it work. And they said, well, what about your degree <laughs> that we just spent a lot of money on? And, and I said, well, this is, this is what I want to do. I want to explore it. So here we are. So mom and dad, you, you've get, you're getting your money back. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And the last thing I suppose I would like to throw in is my degree was in philosophy. And my dad asked me when I got my degree, all right, so what's your philosophy, son? I said, well, I'm going to get a job and pay off my student loans. And I remember he looked at my mom and said, Gene, this was time well spent. And that, that just cracked me up, you know. So we just really keep great. it simple. Thanks, Jeff, Rob, thank again you so uh, for your time. I all certainly right. appreciate it and wish you and the company all the best. Thanks again. All right, see you now. Bye-bye.